record, but I forget. <laughs> um, the Build Back Better plan, um, the, the bill is in suspension and many of the key climate components of that bill have been stripped out. Uh, we are in the wake of COP26 and more um, empty, disappointing uh, conversations and decisions at that global level. Um, but at the same time, we are in the midst of resistance, which has been powerful. And uh, we're here to share with you about what is being built at the state level, at the local level, and what is happening um, in indigenous resistance all over the country. The dominant narrative is that the big things that we're doing are not working. So the story that isn't being told is about the young people, the indigenous communities and the grassroots leadership that is winning and building power. And those are the stories that we're here to talk about today. There is incredible out of the box strategies that are being developed and they're winning. And MVP has played an important role in that. And to anyone who's been a part of Movement Voter Project, thank you, you've been a part of that. And if you're joining and learning about all this for the first time, thank you for being here. So if you haven't had a chance to introduce yourself, please share in the chat. It's amazing to see people from all over. I know different circles of, of my communities are represented here. And I'm really excited to pass the mic to Una Koi, who was one of the seeders of the Climate Vote Fund. And she's gonna be leading us into these discuss discussions and sharing these stories. And then I'm gonna come back at the end and we'll just share a little bit of more information about how you can share this with others, how you can be involved, if you wanna volunteer, and uh, just some ideas for how we can take action together. Over to you, Una. All right. Hello, everyone. Thanks for taking some time to join us today. Um, so happy to have you all here for this window into the Climate Vote Fund. I'm Una Coy. I live in Northampton, Massachusetts, which is in the Connecticut River or Quinnitequa River Valley. And um, I'm a senior advisor on climate at Movement Voter Project. I'm also a donor to MVP, both as an individual and in collaboration with my mother. Um, as a family, we um, helped seed the Climate Vote Fund in 2019 and continue to support it with financial resources and as thought partners. Um, I'm also the mother of two boys and I'm a, a former commercial vegetable farmer and farmer's market manager and now a gardener and herbalist and I bring those parts of myself to this work as well. Um, so I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the structure of today, how we're, how we're structuring it. Um, first, I'm going to introduce you to these three amazing women. Um, and then I'm going to ask them some pointed questions so you can get a sense of their brilliance and what their feet do on the ground every day. Um, and um, I'd love you all to just picture us sitting together around a table. Like that's the, the vibe we're going for is that we're all, we're here in a, in a relaxed space hearing about this work. Um, and I'm going to introduce each of these women and then ask them questions. So, uh, so I'm going to talk for a little while <laughs> um, about, about them, and then we'll move into the questions. So first off, we are totally blessed to have Susanna Almanza here with us today. Um, she's a mother, a grandmother, and also a, a grandmother of the environmental justice movement. She's an East Austin, Texas native. Um, more specifically, she's a co-founder and executive director of People Organizing in Defense of Earth and Her Resources, also known as PODER. It's a 30-year-old environmental justice organization based in Austin, Texas. And Susanna has a long history of fighting for justice in the East Austin community and winning on issues such as tackling legacy pollution from petrochemical industries and halting pro-gentrification local ordinances. She was selected to join the Biden administration's White House Environmental Justice Advisory Board. So she brings that federal perspective too. She's, she's a bridger <laughs> between those worlds. Um, so welcome, Susanna. Thanks for making the time for being with us today. Um, 
So I've also, so I'm going to move on to Laura Flynn. I've had um, the honor of learning so much about Minnesota from Laura, MVP State Advisor for Minnesota. And I'm excited for you to hear from her. You might be able to tell from the compelling way that Laura <laughs> speaks that she's also a writer and she's a mother of 13 year old twins. Um, today, she's she's going to speak with us primarily about the lasting effects of the indigenous led resistance against the, the line three pipeline in Minnesota, which she's been deeply involved in. Um, and as, as MVP state, state advisor, she supports 25 grassroots partners in Minnesota. That's on the, on the regular. Um, welcome Laura. We realized when we put this together that we're all in different time zones, the four of us. <laughs> so moving through them here. Um, in her role as director of the Climate Vote Fund um, at the Movement Voter Project, Julissa Arce Mendez brings so much heart and care to this work. Um, since I started working with Julissa, the question, is this a real solution or a false solution, is never far from my mind, along with, do the frontline communities have a voice? Um, she has supported social movements for nearly 10 years and has focused on organizing within philanthropy to move resources to frontline grassroots solutions and to center their voices. Um, she has an organizing background working in, with communities in Florida and Boston, and she currently lives in Albuquerque, New Mexico. All right. So thank you all for being here. Um, my first question to all of you, um, and we're going to start with you, Susanna, is what roots you or has rooted you in this environmental justice and climate justice movement? You are on mute right now. Okay, can you hear me now? <laughs> Famous words. Okay, I'm Susanna, thank you. And I'm honored to be here with you all today. And I think what really rooted me is that I grew up in segregated East Austin and also living in poverty. And I had, my parents were Spanish speakers, but they were very humble. Uh, and they taught me very early on the difference between the things you need and versus the things you want. And really I'm never creating, <clears throat> never creating any waste and uh, also they had a great respect for, for the earth, which we recognize as mother earth because she was always giving. And so I had the opportunity as a very young child um, to work in the garden. And, and I'll say that my mother would always say, Susana, you have to massage the earth and the earth will give back to you. And I thought, oh, was she just trying to give me to work or is this for real? <laughs> and it turns out the earth did give back as I massage as I massaged her. So she always put it in a real life uh, entity when it came um, to Mother Earth. Uh, and I always attribute uh, those uh, values that my parents taught me, uh, those of um, really speaking, of uh, respecting people, respecting humanity, but also respecting nature. Uh, and my mother was a healer. And so I learned very early on uh, the roles that plants and insects and animals played in our lives. And for me, uh, knowing all of that and growing up, up uh, in that particular, uh, growing up in a world where there was a lot of uh, discrimination and racism based on the color of your skin, the language you spoke and your income, because we, we I did grow up in poverty, even though I did not know it, because I would have a very happy childhood, because I don't think there was not one creek in Austin that we did not get to explore. And so we were always in nature. And I think that all of these things really rooted me. I grew up from the civil rights movement, uh, the Brown Beret movement, the Chicano movement, and then the environmental justice movement. And the environmental justice movement was more into the indigenous concepts that I had learned as a child, uh, because it was understanding that the environment was not just about nature kind, but it was about nature kind and human kind interwoven and interlocked and really inseparable. And so all of these things 
kept me on the path of justice that I say, but also um, grounded me very much in the environmental justice, social justice movement. Thank you, Susanna. Mm -hmm. um, Laura, I'll ask it again. What roots you or has rooted you in this environmental justice and climate justice movement? Thanks, Una. Can you guys all hear me? Yeah, I'm good. Okay, um, thank you. Um, I would say my two 13 year old children root me in climate justice, um, knowing that the state of the world that we're leaving them uh, and how uh, deeply frightened and engaged they are with climate issues even at age 13. Um, it's a really powerful motivator for me. I know I need to be able to tell them every day that I'm doing everything I can to give them a livable planet in the future. Um, and the other side of it is the lands and waters of Minnesota, which is my adopted state, lands, waters, forests of Minnesota that are, we spend a lot of time outside. It's an incredible gift. I think that I've come to understand is we have some of the last boreal forests in North America here and we have to protect them. And we have the largest clean water um, lake in Lake Superior and we have to protect it. And I think in the future, Minnesota may be kind of a climate refuge. And so I feel like part of my work is to protect that land. Um, and then in this last year, I've been incredibly privileged to build much stronger relationships with indigenous leaders who led this line three fight. And I feel like just working with them, being with them, learning from them has rooted me much more deeply in a seventh generation vision of land stewardship and care and kind of that we need um, also a spiritual core to the work that we're doing if we're gonna succeed. Um, so I'll pass it back to you, Una. Awesome, thank you, Laura. Julissa, what roots you or has rooted you in this environmental justice and climate justice movement? Yeah, hi everyone. Um, well, first, thank you so much for making the time to come out. I know you all have a lot of stuff on your schedule, so it just really means a lot that you're here and you're showing up to learn more about our work. Um, I'm Julissa, and you know, I been thinking a lot about this question because I think right now, you know, it is such a scary moment. And a lot of the things that we thought were gonna, you know, help fix these, you know, impacts um, are sort of letting us down. And, you know, for me, what roots me when I feel fear or anxiety is thinking about the incredible people that I've had the privilege of meeting throughout this work. Um, people from communities, frontline communities, indigenous communities, international communities who um, I think beside, you know, um, just them resisting, they're able to find joy. Um, and that is just such a critical thing, you know, that both can live together, right? Joy and fear um, and, and the resistance of continuing to push forward. That, that really helps ground me um, when I start getting these feelings bubbling up inside of me. Um, and you know, as I think about them, uh, I, I also think about my family. My family's from Puerto Rico. Um, we have a long history. Uh, and I think, you know, the, the matriarchs of my family really hold me down. I think about all the sacrifices that they've made for me to be here, for me to have the privilege to, uh, to live the life that I have. Um, I just really try to, you know, root myself in, in that and and ask them for guidance uh, quite often. Um, so, so yeah, um, thank you. Thank you for that question. Thank you all for sharing so personally. I feel like this is, we all need to find our roots through this time. And so it's awesome to hear what those roots are for each of you. Um, so we're gonna, move up to those great northern woods of Minnesota that Laura was um, painting for us. I don't know if any of you all have 
spent time around Lake Superior, but I sure fell in love with that lake um, and also um, the headwaters of the Mississippi. So those are the waters that um, are surrounding one of the most important pipeline fights of our time, equal in size and scope to the Keystone fight. Uh, Native communities alongside their allies, allies worked tirelessly to push the Biden administration to stop the construction of this tar sands pipeline. We have not succeeded yet. <laughs> um, but Laura, can you tell us where things stand now in this fight for, against line three and like what has come out of this movement? I know I just saw on Instagram last week some young people shutting down an Amy Klobuchar event chanting stop line three. So it's not over at all. Mm -hmm. Um, thanks, Una. So yeah, it is not over. Um, I think some of the people weren't that young. I think my husband might have been there at that event. Um, but I don't know, I can't say for sure. And um, it is not over because we're still fighting in the courts. There is still a federal case could go our way. Um, people are continuing to fight on the ground right now. They're monitoring. Uh, Enbridge has done incredible damage to the rivers, like all these leaks and um, damaged, um, uh, damaged rivers. And, um, and there's like all this. An aquifer, right? Aquifers, thank you, thank you. I was like, what is that word? Aquifers, they damage a massive aquifer. And so there is work there that could eventually lead to, there's like monitoring of that and then work to that could lead to a shutdown. I don't think it's gonna happen at any time really soon, but I know that this movement is far, far from over. And more than that, I also know that the Line 3 movement is already seeding the next wave of climate organizing, much like Standing Rock seeded the next five years of organizing and really changed the whole parameters of how people imagined resistance to fossil fuel infrastructure and indigenous leadership. Um, so that said, we're at a pretty devastating moment though because this tar sands oil is flowing under the Mississippi River and to the port um, at Lake Superior. So it's, it's bad and it happened under a democratic governor and a democratic president. And it's it, both of whom had promised to respect treaty rights and to make climate a major priority, and both of whom utterly betrayed those promises by allowing Line 3 to go through. So there's no kind of soft peddling that. That's where we're at right now. Um, but when I look at it, I think about like this movement used every possible tact of mobilization from mass mobilization to direct actions. There are over a thousand arrests on the front lines. There was ceremony, concerts, music, puppets, children's actions, thousands of distributed actions across the country aimed um, of all kinds, but specifically aimed at banks who were funding the pipeline, lobbying hundreds of thousands of letters to decision makers here in Minnesota and nationally, actions in DC, action, you know, bird dogging, such as the Amy Klobuchar action, but also Biden, Jill Biden, all of our senators. Um, and we haven't stopped the oil. So it's, it's tough, like when you've done that much, and you still can't have the impact. And I think what we have to say is that we haven't yet built the power to actually stop this kind of fossil fuel infrastructure, not yet. Um, and I mean, the other thing I'd add is that, that this massive and inspiring resistance had to do all of that in the midst of a, of a pandemic. So that certainly didn't make it any easier, but to have accomplished all of that in a pandemic is an incredible accomplishment. And we haven't built the power to stop it. And I think it really comes down to something that is the same problem for the climate movement nationally, which is that we have not yet built a really broad based mass multiracial climate movement in this country. You know, I mean, for people who've been working their whole lives on climate, that's really hard to hear, but I think it is really true. We still have kind of a white led climate movement on the one hand that is well funded, um, but that is not rooted in communities of color and that is not led by working class people. And we have frontline communities coming out of environmental justice and an environmental racism movement who are oftentimes on the front lines directly confronting fossil fuel infrastructure, but who until now have not been well-funded, 
have not been well supported and and not at the decision making tables of power. Um, so what's you know so that's that's sort of what we're up against and what we're facing. And then on the other hand, I think that the Line Three movement is actually a great template for the kind of movement we need to build because it really was multiracial. It was indigenous. It is and continues to be indigenous led. And thousands and thousands of people of all races came to Minnesota or came from Minneapolis and went up and spent time in indigenous led resistance camps, put their lives on the line. A lot of them were young, but they weren't all young. And they learned about treaty rights. They got a glimpse into an indigenous um, worldview. And this was like a life changing experience for those people much in the way that Standing Rock or Occupy or other movement moments are. And we can't yet see what will come of that, like where all those people go. But I know that there are dozens of indigenous leaders who emerged through this movement who were not, you know, young people who had never organized before and certainly hadn't spoken in front of a thousand people. And towards the end, they were, they organized uh, several thousand people at the Capitol here in, um, in St. Paul and spoke and they've gone to DC and some of them are at COP um, this last week. So it's like, we have a whole new crew of people who are engaging in this work and taking on leadership. Um, and then there was also some just incredible stuff. So our partners um, here in Minnesota, um, Honor the Earth, MN350, which has an indigenous uh, led office up in Northern Minnesota near the reservations and Indigenous Environmental Network were three of the core organizations that led the Line 3 work. And those are that those were sort of how MVP entered this work in helping to raise money for them. And we raised over $3 million during this year to support that work for them and other critical organizations like GNU Collective that led a lot of the direct action. Um, but they were actually joined by some of our other partners. So last summer at the Treaty People Gathering, where um, there was this huge 2,000 person gathering in northern Minnesota, a lot of our other city-based partners went up. So a group like Copal, which organizes, is a, it's a statewide Latinx organization. They brought a delegation of 15 people up there and they, they camped out for three days. Um, we're learning from indigenous leaders and making those connections and CARE Minnesota, which organizes primarily um, Muslim um, people in the Twin Cities, many of whom are from East Africa or Somali folks, um, also went up line three, wrist arrest, and made some really powerful connections. And this is kind of like a small thread, but I think it's like kind of shows what can come from a movement moment. They um, are now in conversation with Honor the Earth about um, Honor the Earth is buying a piece of land that's going to become a goat farm. And that Somali, there's 200,000 Somalis in Minnesota. Goat is their primary meat of choice. All the goat currently comes from New Zealand and Australia, which is pretty bad. It's something like um, 200 goats a day or something. I don't know. It's incredible. So they want to do a goat farm up there in northern Minnesota and also have Somali um, families and children be able to go up and, and um, connect to the land because they almost exclusively live in the cities and no longer have the kind of connection to the land they had when they were growing up and they want to do that. So that's like the type of project that you couldn't imagine happening um, but that came out of this movement and that's maybe a little invisible, but I think that is really the seeds of real change and creating like a different kind of food system and actually um, all these kind of cross-racial connections. So I think that's, that's where the hope lies. And there are about five land back projects that are coming out of the line three um, movement where people are uh, native organizations organizers are purchasing lands and creating cultural resurgence centers in those places. And that's a direct impact of this movement. Um, and then the last thing I'd say, there's also, I mean, MVP is an electoral organization. So there are some big electoral impacts here too. I think we're gonna see a wave of um, indigenous and other climate um, leaders stepping up to run for office out of this because it's so enraging and we could see that we didn't have, you know, we had some support, but we didn't have the kind of support we should have. And over the last five years, as um, MVP has been funding in our state, 
that's been, um, there has been an upsurge of young women and people of color running for state legislator and other local office. And I think that we will see an even bigger surge in 2022. And that, so that one of the key leaders in the movement it was a young woman named Heather Keeler who won a legislative seat in 2020 in Moorhead, Minnesota. She's a native woman who um, was at Standing Rock for like a year during the Standing Rock uprising and directly decided to run for office because of that. She in turn let, led many Minnesota legislators to participate directly in the line three struggle. And I think we'll see a lot more people like her stepping up to run for office. And that that's a really exciting prospect. So I think those are some of the directions where the work will continue to go. Um, and I think I should probably leave it at that. Awesome, thank you so much, Laura. And if folks wanna know more, Laura has much more to share too, I'm sure. Um, so we are gonna head down to the hill country of Texas now, to those creeks that Susanna <laughs> spoke to us about and the springs, the beautiful springs of Texas. Um, uh, so Susanna, we have a two part question for you. We know Poder has been fighting for environmental justice in Austin for over 30 years. I'd love for you to talk to us about how Poder has built power in Austin in recent times and how that has impacted your communities and how it was threatened by Prop A. And for those of you who yeah. haven't been following Austin or Texas politics closely, Prop A was a ballot measure that was just defeated on election day that would have led to more policing in Austin. Yeah, absolutely. So I wanna talk a little bit about that because I think uh, um, using a variety of tools and resources provided by MV uh, MVP uh, got for that organizing to fight against Prop A. And Prop A was an initiative that was backed by a Republican-based group, which called itself Save Austin Now. And really it translated more into becoming a police city or people would say the police state, right? Because it was talking about hiring, uh, bringing on 300 to 600 more police, uh, 300 in the first year, and then continuously uh, hiring more police through five years. But not just that, it would also cut the budget because you would have to uh, uh, would consume about from 270 to 600 million of the city's budget uh, to increase the police. And, and as you all know, this has been part of a, a movement that's been led just like in voter suppression legislation. It's targeted low income and communities of color. And that's what Prop A was really about. It was the backlash from the George Floyd and the Black, Black Lives Matters movement. Uh, that's what it was about. And you could see that happening, unfolding these different trends throughout the United States, how people were reimagining uh, how police reform should be really looking at, looking like, and how were they impacting uh, communities, right? And that was no different here in Austin. So from Austin, we really made history uh, because we put together a coalition for the first time, very first time in the history of um, the city of Austin, where 115 organizations, 39 elected officials, 200 individuals gathered together to defeat Prop A. And it was a lot of work. It was about community education, community engagement. It was door to door knocking. Uh, it was using all the different forms of social media. Uh, and it was talking, networking uh, with all of these different members, right? And we really had to put out what was, um, how was it gonna impact us? And it was gonna be cutting a lot of the social services, EMS, fire, libraries and parks. And not a lot of the climate initiatives that we were uh, pushing forward also. Uh, so we know that Prop A was going to harm so many communities and so many people in so many ways, but it was going to, it was built on a movement of racism and also a movement that was attacking our democracy. 
And so at the local level here in Austin, and we all know um, that, the, that the state here, we've had a lot of legislation that has been uh, on voter suppression, women's rights, uh, you name it, just about everything. As a matter of fact, this Prop 8 came about because Austin had passed an ordinance to defund the police. And really defunding the police was really an alternative to where can other funds go to using uh, police forms, because let me just back up a little bit. The police in Austin, Texas are the highest paid police in the entire state of Texas, okay? The entire state of Texas, the police in Austin are the highest uh, are the highest paid. So it wasn't like they were underfunded or anything. And so people saw, well, uh, we need special services. We need people to be able to go out and help people with mental health problems. This is not, we've seen a lot of people killed by the police because of mental health problems. We need to have people who were professionals, people knew how to deal and work with mental health a crisis, people who know how to work with domestic violence crisis, all of these, and people were reimagining how do we fund these different services and how do we change the system of that we currently have of policing, not just here in Austin, but throughout the whole United States. And I think a lot of people are moving in that direction is how do we look at policing and how do we do alternatives that really serve the communities and how do we make police more as servants of the communities uh, and not oppressors of the communities. So really gathering together, we were able to defeat Prop A. And really to us, it was that we were able to, we sent a clear message uh, that the police system as it is really needs to change. Uh, the other message was that democracy needs to stay in place and that suppression, oppression, uh, has to change and has to go away. And I think that that's what the, the entire defeat of Prop A was uh, got. And, and when you looked at it, uh, this was a really where we had over 20% of the voter turnout when it was only constitutional amendments and two propositions. No one was running. No one was running on this ballot. So whenever you look at, you know, an election where there's no one running, it's a very low turnout, it's usually about seven to 11%. Uh, and all we had was, like I say, the eight um, constitutional amendments and the two props, but yet 20%. And what we had done in the last year was really educate, register people to vote. We did mail outs, we knocked on doors. So we had already increased uh, the voter turnout in the low income and communities of color. So we target for the lowest turnout precincts uh, last year, thanks to MVP with their resources. And so that was really helpful. And this time coming around and really getting out there and going back and, and uh, talking to those people who I vote and educating them about uh, Prop A. And I think that all of these measures were able to really help us move forward and to uh, defeat um, Prop A and really the continuation now of the coalition building that was very diverse for the first time, very diverse, uh, working now, let's keep that diverse movement. How can we work together on common issues? Uh, that's really important to us. So we know the next step with the elections coming up, how do we continue to educate the voters uh, to give them the true stories on who the candidates are, who the issues are, and so they can make a really informed decision uh, about what's happening. And now Poder, like she said, we've been around for 30 years. Our big fight, the first fight was taking on transnational billion dollar corporations, which were the tank farm, six of the largest tank farms uh, uh, oil corporations in the world, Exxon, Chevron, Cipro, Texaco, Gulf Coastal Space, all of these, some have had merged over the years, but they were contaminating uh, our environment and the people, the health of the people. And so we saw our community, the so-called fence line communities, being exposed to benzene 720 times over the allowable rate. 
which means they were really poisoning our communities. And we know benzene is a known carcinogen. But how we organized to you know, shut down uh, that tank farm and did it in such a short period of time was a big victory uh, for the community. But what took more time was about 11 to 12 years monitoring the cleanup process of the tank farm. And at the same time, working on alternatives to the petroleum, uh, already beginning to look at, um, we need to get away from fossil fuels and then working with other people who are working more on legislation uh, at the state level, right? And so I think that a lot of times um, the recognition of what communities of color and Prince Line communities have been doing for decades and decades um, are not recognized of how they have brought to the forefront of how bad these corporations are and how bad they are for the health of the people, but also how bad they are for the health of the environment. Uh, and we recognize that because we've lived next door around the corner down the street from them. And I think that we've exposed a lot of what, what's really damaging our environment and understanding how that has impacted our climate and how, you know, you know, the water change is climate change. All of this, you know, our whole access uh, to water and what's happening. And, and so we're really working on this and we're really working on how that budget that would have been slashed now is how do we bring solar, solar energy to low income and communities of color. That's one of our biggest campaigns is that advocating for solar energy, especially if you heard like in Texas when the grid went down uh, and how you know all of the state went down and then some people for three days, some people were for months without electricity and how that board, none of them were from Texas and now how they, they all jumped ship after the problems that they caused and how they corrupt that system was. Uh, and so these are all the kind of things that we want to look at because we're going into another winter phase and how do we protect uh, the most vulnerable population. And we think that solar energy is one of those things that we really need to do. And how do we pilot a solar project, you know, in the lowest income community uh, to make sure that we're addressing that. And so this is all related to our whole climate health equity program. So we have a climate health equity program and within that uh, falls all of these different things that have to do uh, with the environment. As, as we said earlier, uh, there's always um, environmental solutions, but we have to look at solutions without harms. If we talk about a solution, uh, are we making sure they're not burdening low income and communities of color and making sure that these solutions are also benefiting uh, the most vulnerable population. But she talked about climate change and how it's not because the voices of those, the most vulnerable and those that have been impacted have not always been at the table. And I think just yesterday, Biden released uh, to the scientists in the area about uh, accepting indigenous knowledge, looking at oral history observation and looking at how uh, scientists should be looking at all those different measures. And so these are all things that I think that uh, I don't look at it all uh, gloom and thing because I try to keep in a very positive <laughs> and a very positive uh, perspective uh, because I feel like every day I wake up, I'm blessed. I get to see another day. And I said, if we just take it like that and then work together um, to really address the issues uh, and I know that they're complicated issues, but I think together, little by little, we're changing um, the world and the way it really, uh, how we see each other and how we, how we function together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Susanna. <clears throat> I, I agree, waking up and feeling blessed and grateful seems like every time I remember to do that, I feel, <laughs> just ready to go. Um, and I, I think hearing you speak to the, the, the diverse coalition that came together around Prop A, I would say that 
from my perspective, and that's that's the kind of work that MVP always wants to support is the whole ecosystem. So thank you for sharing that part. Um, mm -hmm. So we've we've heard from these two amazing people on the ground in their places. We're gonna swing over to the desert of New Mexico and hear from Julissa. Um, and Julissa, as, as you have been supporting grassroots frontline organizations and communities with both money and capacity building support, can you talk to us what about your approach to this work and how you achieve and like how you, how you achieve your goals um, through your role at MVP with both money and this other kinds of support. Um, yeah. Yeah. And why, maybe why do the front lines matter? Like we've been talking about the front lines in various ways, but maybe you can just reiterate why that matters. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I, I think I just want to add a little bit more to what both uh, Susana and Laura said. Um, I think, you know, about our approach here at MVP. Um, you know, I think it's really recognizing sort of the gaps within the climate movement and just being really honest about them. And, you know, for me, it was really critical to um, intentionally incorporate environmental justice into our uh, strategy. Um, you know, they're, they're not, they're different, right? Climate and climate justice and environmental justice oftentimes are really different um, when in reality, you can't have climate justice without environmental justice, right? You can't leave communities behind. Uh, so that felt really important to me uh, to have as a, as a foundation um, in this work um, and in this role. And, you know, for me, I think my approach um, to my role has, has really been about solidarity. Um, I'm, I'm just constantly asking my que the, the questions to myself around how can I be a good solidarity partner? What does being a good solidarity partner actually mean? Um, and to me, that really means walking alongside our grantees. Um, it's, you know, uh, being honest and transparent and vulnerable. It's really about relationship building. Uh, understanding that that takes a lot of time. It can look really messy sometimes and that's okay. Um, and, you know, there's always like a resistance and attention, I think, to, to always like uh, move in that space um, uh, from a place of abundance, from a place of, of time, from a place of trust. Uh, so, you know, I, I do feel that tension sometimes. Um, I'm lucky that I work in a place where uh, you know, we, we align in our values and um, I have the flexibility to, to uh, formulate, right, this, um, this fund in a way that I, I have learned to support groups. So that feels really good. Uh, so, so that's what really, that's been my approach. Um, and I think in terms of like the way that we fund, right, I think it's important to recognize that there are structures within um, our organization that also need to reflect these values. And it includes supporting organizations in the ways that they need support. Um, so what does that mean, right? That's like, okay, well, what is that? Well, I think it's like continuous support. So, you know, we at MVP fund throughout the year, um, as we're always fundraising, we're, we're trying to get money out as nimbly and as quick as possible. Um, we don't require any crazy, you know, reporting um, so we try to make the reporting processes really less tedious. Um, we are building relationships with groups on the ground. If there's a crisis, we're there. You know, we're supporting groups. Um, I know that with Susana uh, and, and some other groups in Texas had dealt with this, you know, the winter storms. Uh, we, you know, were able to move money out uh, to them um, and, other, and other crises as well. And, and I think it's having the, the flexibility to be, uh, to move money, the type of money, supporting groups with multiple buckets of money from capacity building to political work to, you know, non-political get out the vote work is all really critical. Um, and I think to your question around, um, so like, I, I, let me just wrap that up. So I think it's like, you know, uh, th those are some of the ways that we approach the work and, and so forth. And I, I want to give you a really good example because I think obviously Susanna's on here, but it is an amazing example. That was my timer. I'll try to wrap it up. <laughs> um, 
you know, we, we did support uh, emerging organizations, um, not emerging in the sense that, you know, um, they haven't been doing work for a long time, but emerging in um, the electoral space. So in wanting to support environmental justice groups specifically, you know, we've been able to move uh, resources to help them um, integrate electoral strategy. So we've done that through, like I said before, but also with one-on-one uh, -on -one coaching. And well, that is one of the groups, but another group that has also done an, an amazing work that I wanna lift up is the North Carolina Climate Justice Collective. They're based in East North Carolina. Uh, they're an uh, organization um, that has organized in this community for a while. Uh, they have been dealing with legacy pollution, environmental justice communities, voter suppression, uh, you name it. And of course, being in North Carolina, they deal with natural disasters or climate disasters such as hurricanes. So, you know, what we were able to do with MVP is um, we were actually able to, you know, have a conversation with them, identify that they wanted to engage in the 2020 election. We moved them their first seed grant and continue funding them. With that money, they were able to knock on higher BIPOC youth in their communities that needed jobs, number one. Number two is being co in coordination with other organizations doing um, canvassing. They knocked on over 10,000 doors, called over 4,000 people. Um, they had events. I mean, you name it, they did it all. Um, and they had never done anything like that before, like in terms of like participating in the election. Um, and it was such a critical thing uh, for us to be able to support because now they're an incredible force in the state of North Carolina. They're anchoring the Green New Deal work. Um, they are uh, opening up their third community resiliency organizing hub, which is a center um, that will galvanize uh, organizing around just transition work. It will also serve as a community center. It's retrofitted so that if a hurricane comes, that center will have power, community people can go there. So it's really the heart, right, of the community um, in this vision of a just transition. And they're continuing to, uh, you know, uh, integrate electoral strategies, right? Understanding that like, we need folks to get out the vote. We need folks to, to you know, register to vote. Um, and, and sometimes folks need to name names, right? They need to know who's who's not on their side. Uh, and that's really critical. And that's also work that we that we support through our C4 efforts. So, um, you know, I, I don't think I have to reiterate it much, but it's just so critical to continue supporting and really prioritizing frontline community groups. As you've heard, they have the answers. They know what their communities need. Our role is to listen, to support them in the ways that they need and to advocate on their behalf. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll end it there. Thank you, Julissa, for bringing it back around to the role that MVP plays. I mean, I think part of that is to have those critical conversations and to ask people if they would like to do this work, if they would like to start doing the electoral work and voterize. And sometimes that's a new question they've never been asked before. Or they didn't feel like they had the capacity to do that. Um, so we, it's, it's close to the end of this briefing. Um, if people have questions, you could put them in the chat right now. Um, and we'll try to move through a few. Um, there's one here that um, I think maybe Julissa and Laura, you'd be the folks to answer this. Um, somebody would love more talking points about why it's beneficial to donate through MVP rather than directly to the partner organizations. So I'm wondering if either of you can speak to that. I, I, I can do that. I mean, we don't actually um, care. We, we, we like to try, we, we in, we're kind of agnostic as to whether people should give directly to the groups or to give to MVP, but we would like to connect with you about it because um, we're working with an entire ecosystem of groups and it's helpful for us to know where money is going and where it's not going. So um, we can work with you to advise groups that you might give to and you could just give the money directly to them. The money that MVP raises, um, we don't take a percentage of that. We raise our operating budget separately. 
So um, you're not, you know, it's not like we're taking something off the top. Um, but we encourage people to give both ways, to give directly to MVP, because then we have a bunch of money to figure out um, on a monthly basis where that money needs to go, like to answer urgent needs as they come up in Texas or North Carolina or Minnesota. Um, but we also encourage people to build those relationships. We, we also, by, by going through MVP, it can be easier because the groups then don't necessarily have to maintain relationships with thousands of donors. We're sort of taking some of that role, so kind of doing some of that fundraising work for them. And they do one report to us rather than a report to many, many different donors. So that's like an efficiency built into funding MVP. But honestly, if you wanna move money directly to groups, we're thrilled. Our partners are all listed on our website. You can see them and you can do that there. Thanks, Laura. So there is a question about um, what you all think or feel actually. What do you feel about carbon pricing? Um, so we actually were going to ask a, a similar kind of question to this that was about, um, you know, top down solutions versus ones that come from the community. So anyway, if if um, Julissa or Susanna want to speak to this, we don't have a lot of time, so I just ask you to be brief. Susanna, I'll defer to you if you want to take that or, you know, whatever you want. You're on mute. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, uh, real quickly, because this is sort of like carbon pricing, carbon trading. I mean, we've seen a lot of this uh, from the past uh, that keeps coming back around. And so are we really, um, are we really just pushing it to another, uh, another city, town, or country when we talk about uh, carbon, trade, carbon pricing. Uh, and so again, we have to look at, is there is it going to burden uh, one particular community in order to look at this alternative uh, on carbon? Thank you. And I, I'm, I'm keeping track of the time and I know that some folks may drop off. So I just wanted to add a few ways to stay involved. And then if are, some of the speakers want to continue answering questions. We could answer this question more. Um, we can. I, I'll stay and and talk with folks who who want to stay on. Um, but I wanted to share with everyone here just um, a few ways to get involved. So if you're already connected to MVP and you're connected to um, one of our um, a, a donor advisor or an organizer you can talk with them and say, I want some of my giving to go towards the climate fund. And so that would mean that you are supporting this integrated strategy where, um, you know, Julissa is supporting groups to voterize, to understand how to do electoral work, to bring them into a relationship, long-term relationship, hold them over the course of an election. And it's a really, it's a really deep approach. Um, and uh, if you are just interested in learning more about how to, oh, how to just like my like top takeaways, what you can do. If you're going to give for the 2022 elections, give early and you know, consider making that plan now and organize others. So you can become a volunteer at uh, and throw a house party for MVP. You can invite others. If you wanna do that work specifically for the climate vote fund, we can talk about doing that. And I'll be, uh, uh, and Yulisa will be points of contact to help you um, figure out how to do that. And the last is, like I said, make a plan for Climate Vote Fund to be a part of how you're thinking about the different ways that you can give. So to learn more about tax deductible giving or giving to Poder uh, directly, contact Yulisa. And to learn more about donating stock or uh, major gifts, you can contact me. And the last is just give now and share. Like if, if this was hopeful, if it was clarifying, if it illuminated something new for you, we would love for people to um, hear these stories and have some of the hope and uh, the clarity from this conversation ripple out. And if you wanna volunteer to be a part of um, putting together uh, an even bigger event in, uh, in the new year, you can contact me. 
I'm going to move us out of these slides so we can go back to um, you know any final questions and I'll put my contact information and a way to donate in the chat. See, I'm seeing a lot of people hopped off, but we still have 30 people here. Are there any mm -hmm. other questions or is there another piece of the feeling about carbon pricing that you want to talk about? Um, I love it. I love it. Can we unmute? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for being here. I don't know if Julissa is still here, but oh, there you are. Or or is it Susanna who from Poder who spoke? Thank you to responding to my question on carbon pricing. And I I just wanted to say to Susanna that a carbon price without a dividend, a monthly dividend that keeps. Uh, all our families whole, especially those in our frontline communities, is not something we should be supporting. But and yeah. when it keeps when there's a monthly dividend check, people on the front in the frontline communities not only are maintained wholly, but also are ahead because their carbon footprint is is little smaller. And I have reached out to you, Julissa, in the chat, and I hope that you and I can maybe speak. I've been a supporter of MVP for many, many years. I've known uh, Billy for 20 years. So I support MVP wholeheartedly, and I support Citizens Climate Lobby wholeheartedly. Thank you, Barbara. Well, yes, please um, feel free to I, I, I'm not, yeah, I was just like scrolling and I didn't see your message, but let's connect um, via email. You okay. know, and I and I think right now, you know, there's a, a lot of different solutions sort of being thrown. Some are being kind of recycled, you know, with an with additions, you know, and, and honestly, it gets a little confusing. Um, but, you know, I, what I, for me, what I always try to say, I think it's like part of that, like, how do I stay grounded? Well, how do I know what's a a, a false solution or a solution that's really based from the grassroots. And there's a few things that I look at. I think it's, well, what, what are my folks hearing? You know, um, who, who's pushing for this? Um, who is their base? Does this organization have a good um, decision-making structure within the organization, right? Are their community members making decisions? And to be honest, I mean, groups are at different places. Um, some are supportive of carbon trading and taxing, others are not. And, or iterations of that, you know? And I think um, it's really <clears throat> important to remember that everybody's at a different political level uh, and, and, you know, and ed education in very tedious, uh, hard to understand, <laughs> you know, solutions as such. However, um, there are numerous reports that I have read that have been put out against um, some of these so solutions, quote unquote. Um, I encourage anyone to, to do research on them. IEN does an incredible, the Indigenous Environmental Network always puts out incredible research um, on a lot of these topics that I find very helpful. Um, and, you know, I think for me as, as someone who's um, in this role between like, you know, help supporting grassroots and, and communicating with donors and funders is, well, you know, I think it's like, well, I got to listen to the groups, you know, like if a group's, what you know, if a group is pushing for something and they feel like they're at a level, then I have to listen to them. And, and we're going to, we're, we're walking alongside, you know, in, in that way. Absolutely. I agree wholeheartedly. <laughs> Thank you. And thank you for your support. It really means a lot. You're welcome. It's my honor, our honor. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for this sweet after party. Um, I really affirm, Barbara, you are an incredible leader and supporter. And it's a joy to get to be 
a donor advisor and walk along, alongside you and be in an event like this where we can all like be sitting around a table together discussing. Mm -hmm. um, and I know there's some new faces here. Jeannie, I'd love to you know connect with you, learn more about your story. Uh, I might have a relation to Rob Beam, just maybe. Um, <laughs> that's my dad. And uh, again, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Laura, Susana, Ulisa. I have learned so much in this process um, from you all. And I am thank you. so thrilled so for what will come next. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Bye.